How's it going my bakers? Hope you're doing great today. Welcome to episode 2 of the Rye Bread series. Let's get to the kitchen and get started. This is another recipe I have adapted from the Rye Baker by Stanley Ginsberg. It is a modified version of the Finnish archipelago bread. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Knowing the principles of bread making is far more valuable than knowing a recipe. Because understanding the principles allows you to modify recipes to suit your taste. Also, who knows whether that recipe in the book is authentic or not. And there is so much conflicting information on the internet too. So I'm not going to follow any recipes step by step and then try to claim that they are authentic or even use the actual name of the bread most of the time. i much rather get inspired by the original and make it my own. I could even argue that my approach makes it more original. Anyhow, what we have here today is an extremely flavorful, sweet, moist and dense rye bread. Slice it nice and thin and enjoy it with your favorite toppings. What makes this even better is that the recipe is extremely simple. You don't need any experience to make this. So let me show you how it's done. Starting with the ingredients. We'll need some white wheat flour, whole grain rye flour, buttermilk, wheat bran, raisins, linseeds, sunflower seeds, molasses, honey, yeast and some salt. And just like I did, you can adjust this recipe to fit your taste. Use different seeds, use different sweetening syrups, throw in your sourdough starter, and adjust the proportions of flour. Wheat bran is not an ingredient I've used much before. Bran is the outside coating of the wheat grain. It is extracted by milling the grains into flour and then sifting out the wheat bran. So you can easily make your own wheat bran at home. All you need is some whole wheat flour and a sieve. Another option would be to simply replace the white wheat flour and the wheat bran in this recipe with whole wheat flour. That would probably make the most sense, but I had this wheat bran and the recipe suggested using wheat bran, so I might as well use it. i will giving you all the options, so you can make up your own mind. When it comes to the equipment, we don't need much. A large bowl, scales, a dough scraper, temperature probe, and a tin for baking the bread in. I'm going to be using my 2 pound USA pan Pullman loaf tin. It measures at around 22 centimeters or 9 inches long, by 10 centimeters or 4 inches wide, and 10 centimeters or 4 inches deep. If you don't own one of these tins, then use a regular 2 pound loaf tin. And with all that out of the way, let's start mixing our dough. In a large bowl, combine the buttermilk, the yeast, the salt, the honey, the molasses, the linseeds, the sunflower seeds and the raisins. And then give it all a good mix. Dissolve the salt completely. Make sure all the ingredients are dispersed evenly throughout the liquid. And whilst I'm getting on with that, let me address a couple of the ingredients that we're using in this recipe. Mainly the buttermilk and the sweet syrups. All of them make this dough slightly acidic, and I'd say that is their most important purpose here. Acidity slows down the enzymes in the flour, and prevents the bread from turning out sticky. That is why you commonly see ingredients like buttermilk, yogurt, beer, vinegar, various syrups, and also sourdough starters being used in rabbit recipes. An acidic environment can prevent amylase degradation, also known as starch attack. It is the enzymes that convert starch into sugar. If this process is left unchecked, it can turn the bread into a gloopy mess. Okay, continuing with the recipe. Next up, add the wheat bran, mix that in, and then follow with the white wheat flour and mix again. I like to add the rye flour last, because it turns this dough into glue, and I like to put that off for as long as I can. Also, it is important to mix in stages, to ensure that all the ingredients are dispersed evenly. And now we are ready for the final ingredient, the whole grain rye flour also known as dark rye flour. A whisk is not going to work here anymore, so use your scraper to finish mixing this dough. At this point, you'll definitely be happy that you used the largest bowl that you could find. This thing is dense and sticky, and it will take you a good minute to mix it up properly. After mixing the dough, prepare the baking tin. This loaf tin is not sticky at all, I do trust it, but I like to grease it with some butter anyway. It will toast the sides of the loaf real nice, and improve the flavor slightly in my opinion. You can use oil instead if you want, or just leave the tin as it is, if you can trust it to not hold on to the loaf. Now if your tin is very sticky, you could line it with some baking paper. Okay, now scoop the dough into the baking tin, and then make sure it goes into all the corners. You don't want to remove the loaf from the tin after baking, and realize that there's a big hole at the bottom of it. The best method here is to wet your hand with water, and press the dough down to fit the shape of the tin. Don't worry about the surface in the beginning, just smush it in there. And once you think that it's reached all the corners, then you can smooth out the surface. If your hand starts sticking to the dough again, then just wet it once more with water. And finally, you can smooth out the surface using your dough scraper. Before we start final fermentation, let's check the dough temperature, just for reference. My dough came out pretty cool because I was using cold buttermilk from the fridge. 
If you leave your buttermilk out at room temperature for a while, you can make your dough ferment more rapidly. Saying that, this recipe contains quite a lot of yeast, so it will rise quickly anyway. It took me around 2 to 2.5 two hours at around 25 degrees Celsius or 77 degrees Fahrenheit. Don't expect this loaf to puff up by a huge amount. Once it's risen by about 30%, it is ready for the oven. Make sure you preheat the oven, 160 degrees Celsius, 320 Fahrenheit, fan off. This is a large, heavy and dense loaf. We need to bake it low and slow. Luckily this baking tin comes with a handy lid. Covering this dough will prevent it from browning too much and too soon, it will prevent the top crust from drying out and it will prevent excessive moisture loss from the dough. If you don't have a lid, cover your loaf with some foil or just cover it with a flat baking tray. Alternatively, spray the top surface with water before you bake it. That will at least help a bit. Okay, let's get this bad boy in the oven. It'll take around two hours to fully bake. Like I said, low and slow. It is pretty hard to tell whether a bread like this is fully baked. It's still super heavy when it comes out of the oven. So one sure way of checking is by using your temperature probe. Stick it into the center of the loaf. If it reads above 94 degrees Celsius or 200 degrees Fahrenheit, it is fully baked. The next step is optional. I decided to drizzle some honey over the hot loaf. It'll make it shiny, nice and sticky, and even sweeter than it already is. We certainly don't have to do this, but there is something that you definitely have to do, and that is to be patient. Whilst the loaf is fully baked, it is certainly not ready. If you don't let bread like this cool down and mature properly, it'll be still gummy inside when you cut it. So after baking, leave it out on the rack to cool down for at least a couple of hours, then wrap it up in some plastic wrap or put it back inside the bread tin with the lid, then leave it to mature for a whole day. Trust me, it's worth it. And breads like these, they only get better in time. It's basically like this. The denser and heavier the loaf, the longer you need to mature it for. I've read that you need to leave pumpernickel bread to rest for at least two days before you cut into it. But of course, I will test this out for myself. One day is definitely the minimum for a bread like this. And here's the result. A dense, moist, flavorful and flexible rye bread. It is not brittle or dry, so it's perfect for slicing it nice and thin. That allows you to make many sandwiches out of this loaf. And because of its size, density and moisture content, it'll stay fresh for many days. This is it 10 days later. It has dried out a little bit, but still nice and moist. And if anything, the flavor has improved over time. And while the process of making this bread takes a day, it will reward you with fresh bread for many days after that. If you do decide to make this, I would love to see it on our Flickr group. You can find a link for that down below. So what do you think this recipe? Which one do you prefer? This one or the previous one? Let me know down in the comments. If you want to see more videos like this one? Click over here. Subscribe to the channel, click right here. That's all I have for you today. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you in the next one.